so welcome to the to the first. Uh, I guess we call this a research workshop. Let's open it in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. I thank you for the students that have come today to really uh, improve their writing skills. And, and we recognize that this is uh, to help us as we improve our writing skills, it also helps us to improve our ability to reason, to think critically. And this will have huge impact in both our preparation for preaching, for teaching, for small groups, Father God. And so uh, there's, there's huge benefit in developing our reading uh, both our reading comprehension and composition, Father God. And so as we, uh, as we really seek to, to just give some highlights and to give some guidance to the students, I pray that they would have clarity and understanding. And I just pray that you bless each one of them. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, great. So we're going to get started. And um, pretty much what I want to do, if, if we have a, an outline, I don't have a PowerPoint. I, I I came back late this morning and I was thinking to myself, man, I, I actually wish I had a PowerPoint. So, so I, I, we are going to work, we're going to do some things on a, on like a whiteboard type thing to give you some recommendations and whatnot. Um, before we continue, can just everyone just mute their mic? What, what, I, what, I, what I want to do is we're going to go through first, we're going to look at the first assignment and I'm just going to, to share with you how I read it, okay? And then after I, I, sh I share with you how I read and how I analyze it, then we'll do some, um, we'll go into that paragraph formation handout. I don't know if you were able to read the paragraph formation handout that I handed out. It's incomplete, but it helps us to, to start thinking. A lot of times it's very difficult for us to write because we're not even thinking about the specific types of sentences we should be using, uh, how, we, how we move from, from uh, putting our thoughts onto paper. So, so we're going to do that. And then lastly, I'm just going to give some more, uh, because that, that handout more focuses upon uh, different types of paragraphs. The last part of this workshop is I'm just going to just give you some, some hints for, and, and uh, I guess recommendations for, for your, your reflection writing. And then I want you to practice maybe one or two weeks and then maybe we'll come back again on a Saturday in two or three weeks from now so that you'll have more questions. We can discuss further. Maybe I can really develop the, uh, the handouts as well. So let's just go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and look at the first assignment. What, what I like to do when I'm reading is when I was in seminary, now I'm doing this all on digital now, but, and I don't know what your budget's like, um, but there's no, right now there's no expense for, for, for the, the class. There's no tuition unless you're enrolled in an MA for credit. And I think only one, one or two from the class is. But if you have the money, um, uh, I would recommend printing out each one of these readings and using several different highlighters and, and then also a, a different color pen. And as you read, because, um, take notes, mark it up, take notes, make comments. And then when you come back to write your reflection, it's really just there. You don't have to go back and think, okay, I remember this, you know, how, so the first thing I want to say, big recommendation is to have at least two or three different color highlighters and then some type of different color pen. So the three different color highlighters that I use is I use a yellow one, a green one and a red one. Okay. A yellow one is just important information. It's important information to highlight. Uh, the green one is something I really like. So it could be really important, but I also really like it. So, uh, and I'm not perfect on that sometimes. Mostly I'm just using yellow, but I will use green to highlight something I like or agree with. And then red, something that I'm cautious or I'm wondering. And, um, and so I'm not, it's not, I'm not really consistent with that, but that's just a good, that's a good practice I'm trying to develop. That was something I've developed more recently. And so as you go back and read the things that you really disagree with, if it's all the same color, you're still looking for it. If you highlight it in red, it just pops out on the page. So, so that's, the, that's the first recommendation I would do. So uh, that's the second. So the first is to print it out if you can. The second is to use the different highlighters and also a uh, different color pen. The, the next thing that I want to emphasize is that there's really, there's three major places in any type of, uh, chapter, any type of book, any type of 
journal article. You have an introduction, you have the body, and you have a conclusion, okay? In the introduction, you want to look for key sentences that really give the direction for what, where the, the author is going to go. In giving and highlighting those sentences, that's like your blueprint, and it really makes uh, comprehending the, 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 the article, the book, uh, the chapter, it makes it a lot easier. So for example, here, history of interpretation. If you look closely here, on, on the right, on the right side here, right, I've highlighted the big, the big sentence, and then several specific, several specific uh, purposes. So look at the big sentence. The big sentence begin where it says a brief, a brief survey of history of the Bible is beneficial in several ways. So first, we know right there that even though the, the chapter is really highlighting it, sometimes it's much, it's more difficult that the, the, the chapter title will not really describe what's going on. But you have the main thesis or the main idea, what's going to happen here is he's going to survey. That's the main idea for the chapter, which you say, Tim, no doubt. Well, fair enough, but other times it's, it's, it's more challenging to discover. And then he gives, he gives specific uh, reasons or purposes. And then what I'm going to do is I just highlight the words first, second, finally. Okay, so there's one, two, three. Okay, and that right there gives you the big idea. So later on, now we're doing reflection paper, so this is different. But later on, if you're supposed to summarize and do a book summary, or because later a higher level we'll, we'll, we'll do this, is that you always want to really... In a, in a summary, you want to highlight, you want to specify what the main thesis is and the purposes or the, the support, different critical components so that the author, if he read your summary, would say, yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's what I was trying to do, okay? So that's the first thing I would highlight and just get in that practice. And then it also helps you understand. Then just throughout here, I'm just highlighting uh, important aspects and, and there's, there's nothing... Um, uh, there's nothing, uh, what's the word? I'm just highlighting things that mean something that's significance for, for me. I put here, okay, so if you notice here, this highlighting here, I'm making the, this, so this is a reflection. So, so, so right here, these two sentences or, or almost paragraphs, I'm making an assessment right here. This is my, this is my assessment. My assessment is, just like commentators and teachers do today. So the statement is, is at the same time, scribes and rabbis vigorously pursued study and teaching of Hebrew scriptures, especially the Pentateuch. They worked to solve problems raised by the text, explaining obscure words and reconcile conflicting passages, okay? And then it goes on to talk about a, a cultural crisis that's fueled. So if I was, if, if I was, if I was writing a reflection paper, if I was one of your, Literally, this could be your quotation, and then I've just made I've just made a critical assessment. I've reflected upon it. I've I've moved from the the, the text of the article to to now making to interacting and making a comparison to today. And the comparison is that this is analogous to today. Now, if I was so so for question number one, what is something that re you resonates or you like and explain? Literally, that could be it. So I really, it's really jumped out at me, and then I've, I've made a, a, an assessment here, and then you can just explain it, and I'll go into details on how you can do it, but, but that's essentially, for question number one, what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a sentence or a paragraph that really, you, you just say, wow, that's a profound truth, I agree with it, uh, and here's my reasons why I agree. Uh, I agree with this, look at how this, we're doing the same type of thing in today, okay? So, so it, that's the extent of question number one. Now I do want you to kind of read through and then you'll probably do this several times and then you pick your best one, okay? But that's essentially a reflection. That's, that's what we're looking to do. So just moving along here. Uh, okay, so for example here, uh, the major distinctive of this school was its allegorical method 
which was rooted in Platonic philosophy, Plato thought that true reality actually lay behind what appeared to the human eye. That is a text's true meaning uh, lay behind the written words. That could be a question that we want further investigation. So that could answer number three. This allegorical method is very surprising to me. Like, I haven't heard of allegorical. No one's talking about allegorical. It seems, this seems very, uh, you know, it's behind, the, it's behind almost like it's hidden. That's really surprising. So again, this is the type of reflection I'm looking for. Just read through and, and you'll come to a place of like, wow, I want to investigate that further. Is that really the case? What is allegorical method? And, and you can just say, I want to study this further. Again, the purpose behind the exercise is number one, to interact. When you're doing this, it's causing you to interact. It's causing you to learn from, from the article, okay, or from the chapter. So watch this. Now I am interacting with the text itself. So look, the central feature of rabbinic interpretation, however, is the practice of Midrash. Basically, Midrash aims to uncover the deeper meanings that, that, rabbi, that rabbis assumed were inherent in the actual wording of scripture. That sounds just like allegorical interpretation, hidden meaning behind the text. So now, if you notice here, this is now, this is an interaction, the previous context. So now I'm really, I'm making, again, this could be a whole nother observation that you make. Wow, uh, it seems that the, that the Pharisees were also following in some way Philo, even though they're calling it Midrash, this allegorical method is almost the same. They're doing the same type of thing. Do you see what I'm saying? So again, this could be, this could be yet another, uh, another re re reflection. So this could answer number one again. So this is, a, this is a whole different set. Now, I only want one. So you can just pick between the two. But again, as we read, we're really, we're really making those connections. Okay, so I was going to share this next week. This is a teaser for class, okay? But... I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read this up, this, this, the highlight, and then I'm gonna explain. And this was something that really has come into my mind recently. And, and this really kind of further solidified. This is, so this was something that I learned. So it's something I learned just in this reading. So, so uh, the authors say, such interpretations may strike modern readers as in, ingenuous manipulations of, of scripture. In fairness, however, one must remember that rabbis held a high view of scripture, they assumed that divine truth resided both within and behind the text. So again, this really confirms, and it's true, that Midrash, this rabbinic interpretation, was very much allegorical. It, there's meaning behind the text, there's meaning in the text. Sometimes they would reinterpret it literally, sometimes they would try to go behind the text to get the spiritual meaning. And the reason why we don't agree with that process, but the reason why they were able to hold to this was because of the two divine, the, the two authorship, the authorship of, of the human and the authorship of the divine. So they're saying, even though the human author didn't know about this meaning behind the text, God did. Okay, now we're not agreeing with that, but, but again, they're holding this high view. But the big takeaway that just kind of exploded in my mind was, so my quote, my comment is, operating with Philo's interpretive, interpretative grid, which is really what it is, their, con their context and, and why the disciples were unsure about the cross and resurrection. So this makes a whole lot, if, if the Pharisees were using allegorical interpretation, the, the, the Alexandrian school is using uh, uh, allegorical interpretation, this midrash, it's behind the text. This makes a whole lot of sense, wait for it, as to why when Jesus would give predictions of his death and resurrection, they didn't understand. <laughs> is he literal or figurative? No one knows. That was just radical for me. That's why, that's why we're like, he's saying he's going to be resurrected. What are you, you're so stupid. We, we look very condescendingly upon the disciples, but the interpretative method of the day was literal and figurative, and it was highly respected. Both were highly respected. So Jesus can say it, and they don't really know what he means. Do you see what I'm saying? And so this really should give us greater insight into how, into how, like, even when Jesus is saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to be, just as the son, just as the serpent was raised in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. He's thinking literal, and they're like, what does he mean? Figurative? Like, they, 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 they couldn't understand until the event happened, okay? And so, 
again, that was an aha moment for me just recently, but it makes a whole lot of sense. And those, those are the type of uh, reflections. Now, I'm not expecting uh, profound uh, things like that, but, but that's kind of where we have to, not only do we read, but we sit back, we sit back and we meditate upon what we've learned. We sit, we sit back and just reflect. We meditate upon uh, what the text is saying, and, 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 and we think like that. Um, and so I understand that there's a lot of reading, and maybe we'll make some adjustments to those readings um, in the future. Um, but that's really the goal of this of, of these re reflective uh, the reflective reading. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So these were some green things. I really like this statement. Um, more than any of it, any of his contemporaries, Aquinas propounded the importance of a literal meaning of scripture. To me, that that was a, a, a truth I did not know before, and that was very that was very encouraging to me, because even though Aquinas is part of the Roman Catholic Church, we, you know we we're Protestants, we're protesting the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, a, Thomas Aquinas, although we might not agree with all his philosophical constructs, and again, this is secondary interpretation, fair enough, but Aquinas was really pushing, Aquinas is a positive voice in the step towards the Protestant Reformation because he's calling everyone back, no, 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 we have to have this literal reading. Uh, sky is the limit if we're allegorical, if we're midrash and doing whatever, there's no limit to what the meaning is, and how can we know what even God's word says if it's just all allegorical and there's no there's no rule it's just so that was just something that really positively resonated with me okay so to outside observers the reform churches departed from luther and calvin in one respect they appeared to place more importance on intellectual agreement with protestant dogma than on the practice of warm and lively personal piety i did not i i understand the caveat that he gave that to outside observers but i do and there, there, that is a problem with some Reformed churches, absolutely. But I disagree. He should have said they also a lot are very pietistic. So, so, so I know a lot of Reformed uh, people. I went to a Reformed seminary, and they're very warm. They're very lively. This, I felt that this maybe was a little bit of a jab at, at, that, at, at, at those type of churches. So I felt, I, I felt that... Um, yeah, he kind of did a stereotype, and I just, I felt that was an overstatement. So again, there, that's where I'm just, I'm marking it in red to say, ah, that, this would be something where I would push back on. This would be a critique that I would have. So I've given you some just importance, interaction within, uh, positive things, and then also this would be one of my critiques. I, I highlighted these authors. I know B.B. Warfield. I'm not so familiar with Green or Beecher, but I was like, wow, th these people are, Figures in North America that critiqued the assumptions of new criticism and promoted an alternate, vibrant new criticism of their own, thus winning a standoff, if not actually reversing the inroads of European criticism. So these are, these are scholars that are pushing back on higher criticism and pushing back on liberalism. And so in this, this highlighting here, I want to further investigate these authors. So again, in the reflection reading, um, maybe you're going to see something like, oh man, I, you know, I didn't realize that they were in this camp. I want to research further. So that's, th this is like another trajectory you can go as, uh, and this is part of the purpose of, of the reading is now we know, okay, if I see the name W.H. Green, I see W.J. Beecher, B.B. Warfield, I, 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 I feel like, okay, I can trust those authors. Maybe I want to investigate them more. And so you were always as we do reading, we're always looking for new resources. We're looking for new authors. We're looking to interact with what's being said. Um, we're looking to, 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 to interact with the critical eye and also trying to learn. And then we're also trying to, to apply it. So there's a lot of different trajectories that you can go in this, in the reading. Okay, so this was another critique that I had. Right here, there's another critique. And then uh, that's it. So actually, this is, I think, 40 pages. All the rest are our footnotes, okay? And there, there's really good content in the footnotes, and um, don't overlook the footnotes, but you don't have to read them. That was actually one qualification that I didn't really realize until I forgot to mention on Tuesday. You're not required to read the footnotes. You're only required to read the content. The footnotes are there for like additional information if you want further investigation or you want to check to see if, if what the author is saying is accurate. 
So that's essentially, that's how I, it would, that's how I interacted with this reflection reading. And I, I, I'm doing that already on the second reflection reading um, I started yesterday. So that's essentially the process. Any questions or comments before we move to, now we're, the, the next part will be dealing with paragraph formation and how my recommendations for how you would form your, your, your paragraphs as you reflect. Any questions or comments, I'll just open it up. In those, those names which you have mentioned, that's the first time I ever heard her, their name. <laughs> so it's zero to my mind. So is there a book where we can, who comes first? Like, for example, uh, these are the first, uh, these are the names of the apostolic fathers. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 their work is this one, and like that one, so that we can see the big picture of this. <clears throat> Of yeah. this, uh, what is what's, what what was written in this hermeneutical? You know. So, so there are some books. You know, that's one of my desires to really have a a list of of church fathers, of church scholars, also of contemporary writers that are really. I mean, that's part of the desire for developing the resource tool to, to give that list of good scholarship that's conservative. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know if there's a list. Typically, teachers will just, in each class, they will have a, I'm actually formulating this, it's not right, but in the syllabus, they'll have, my teacher used to have it, he would have like 30 or 20 sources in hermeneutics, and then he'd have from like a scale from one to five stars. Really good, five stars, one star, okay, this is, you. if you're going to do a research paper, maybe you have to interact, but it's more liberal. So, that, that's a that's a prayer and vision of mine to really come up for EBST and our students a list of 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 um, number one you have church fathers and 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 and, and through in historical theology good people who are making good theology then also good authors that because we want to spend their time with good resources so I don't I don't have a list a definitive list but but I'm going to start making one I, I have started making one. I, I would recommend to all of you right now, if what I'd recommend at this point is that if you're, if you're going to pursue a topic, just send me an email and say, hey, what are some books, what are some authors that you would recommend in this topic? And, and I, that would be the best for right now. Um, I do hope by the end of hermeneutics to have a good list of books and then also scholars that you would want to investigate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so long term, I want to have a, like a bibliography of of really uh, foundational primary sources through church history and then also so great question Henry but uh, I don't have that list in front of me right now it's 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 in my mind <laughs> it's in my mind <laughs> so so what we are going to do now is just to accept just to accept what they said <laughs> well well no so 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 like, for example, in hermeneutics, the resources we've given to hermeneutics so far, it's good. It's good. You can be assured. Yeah. So, but, but if you're reading someone new, just send me, just send me a message saying, Hey, I'm reading this. What is your perspective? And I can tell you that's a really good author. Just be careful here. It's not so good. It's liberal. Yeah. So, but I, the one thing is pastor Henry over time, as we go through this curriculum, you will really see, that for me, that was my experience too. You just, as you learn, as people give you books to read, as you read, you'll really see and be able to identify that, that on your own. You will develop that skill. That will be another skill that you will really identify, that, that, that you will grow in. Okay, let's go ahead now. Let's go ahead to um, the part where you're probably, you're probably wanting to attend is the uh, paragraph formation. So let's, let's go. Let's go into, everyone can see this now. All right, so this, was, this is really in, incomplete. It's, it's uh, lacking talaga, talaga, it's lacking, so I'm sorry. But I hope it'll give you some ideas and then I'll, we'll have the last part of this workshop, I'll have some, some further for your specific thing. So, so when we think about, when we think about paragraph formation what we want to be doing is we want to be thinking about 
three, three big components in any paragraph. You have a topic sentence, which you can see highlighted right here. You have the topic sentence here. Then you have the, the supporting sentences, and then you have a concluding sentence, okay? So in your reflection report, you should have a topic sentence, supporting sentences, and a concluding sentence. Quick definition of, of a topic sentence. A topic sentence is a sentence that introduces the theme or main idea of a paragraph. So you can choose a, you can choose a, a quotation or you can choose, uh, you can summarize it in your own words, but you need to, to create a topic sentence that describes what you're going to be interacting with, okay? And then, then the rest of the set, the rest of the paragraph is going to be composed primarily of a supporting sentence. A supporting sentence is a sentence that supports or describes the topic sentence, okay? Uh, these relate to the topic sentences in some manner. They could be offering descriptions, they could be offering explanations, they could be offering reasons. So those are the three, descriptions, explanation, reasons. But you're supporting that main idea that you're interacting with. And then the concluding, set, the concluding sentence, this closes the paragraph, okay? Um, these type of sentences do not offer any new information. You're synthesizing. So in, in some cases you can synthesize, you can bring, you can bring the, the topic and the support and you can restate it. You can bring it together. You can, you can bring a, make a conclusion and then offer maybe a call to action. So there's a lot of different ways you can go, but you really need to follow that, that pattern. Okay. Now, now this is just an example of a descriptive sentence. So this is different than your reflection paper because in your reflection paper, you're assessing and critiquing something. Okay. So it's slightly different, but I'm just going to give you a descriptive sentence. Okay. Now I do. I have a, a, okay. Now I don't have a, I, I, I failed because this is incomplete. Okay. But there should be a concluding sentence here. <laughs> so this is rough draft. So I have not yet completed, but, um, uh, notice here, descriptive sentence. Here's my topic sentence. German shepherds are excellent dogs. I'm just introducing the topic. And then I'm going to describe them. They are, they often weigh up to 30 kilograms. They have a beautiful multicolored pattern of fur. They are incredibly smart and can learn up to 100 unique commands. So if you notice here, I'm just describing the main topic. Okay. And then and then actually, if, I, if it, this is a rough draft, but the, 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 the concluding paragraph could be, German shepherds are excellent dogs, and I highly recommend that you own one. Okay, so that's, that's coming, that's bringing the, the, the paragraph back to a close, and then it's calling the reader. It's, 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 pre, it's presenting the, the recommendation to the reader, okay? Um, there are some other examples here. So here... I'll just give this again. So this is a narrative. So now it's not descriptive. I'm not describing a topic. I am telling a story or I'm recounting an event. So it's a different type of paragraph. So the support is, is a narration of events. Okay. So uh, last, this is the paragraph without. So one th helpful thing, what you can do is you could actually write out, you could write out as a rough draft, you could write it out like this and then convert it to this. You see that? So if, if, it's, if, it's, if you're struggling writing out the paragraph, you can just, okay, I need a topic sentence and write it out. I need, so I need at least three supporting sentences. Okay, there we go, I write it out. Here's my conclusion. Just, just label it out, just like in a bullet point, and then convert the bullet point into, into a paragraph. So watch this here. So topic sentence. Last Thursday, we traveled to the U.S. Embassy to secure our daughter's citizenship during rush hour traffic. So that's describing the context. <laughs> this was several years ago. <laughs> you can imagine. We left at 5.30 a.m. We only had 33 kilometers to travel. Once we arrived at Aguinaldo Highway, we were bumper to bumper traffic. The traffic became worse when we merged into Capitex Highway. We arrived at the embassy after our appointment only to discover there was no parking. <laughs> 
we missed our appointment and had to return home. So if you notice here, this is a narrative. So there's, there's initial conflict, there's rising action, there's rising action. There's the climax. They made it to the, they made it to the embassy. Oh, Sayang, no parking. Oh! So, so it's, it, it becomes clear at this climax that we miss our appointment, okay? Then there's falling action. We, we returned home, and maybe to really emphasize safety. So there's this falling action. There's not really intensity. Then the conclusion resolution. We were thankful that we were not in an accident and that we could reschedule our appointment for the next week, and we were successful. So, so you see how here it's, it's a narrative paragraph. It's different than the descriptive. It's very different, and it follows, again, this same type of pattern. Okay, there's topic, support, conclusion, but now there's specific, there's a setting, there's initial conflict, there's rising action, there's rising action, there's climax, falling action, the resolution, okay? And, and this is helpful because, especially in narrative in the scripture, we're going to come back to this type of structure. Many of the stories have this type of climax, rising action, climax, resolution, and looking at the resolution, looking at the initial conflict, that's going to help you really understand what the big point of the story is. And if we don't understand how narrative paragraphs, how narrative stories work, um, it, it has application both in unpacking the biblical text and preaching, and it has application in our own writing skills, okay? Now, here's an example of a summary paragraph, and I'm not going to go into those details. You can read this on your own. But in, in a summary paragraph, what, what you're doing is so, for example, because this will be helpful later for your exegetical paper, we'll come back to this, your exegetical paper or your sermon, is that you're going to summarize the content of the previous context or the succeeding context. So here, uh, I'm, having, I'm having you summarize John 1, 1 to 18, John 1 to 5, John 1, 6 to 8, John 1, 9 to 13, and John 14 to 18. So... I want us to become good at rewriting it in our own words and, and, and condensing, okay? So we're not copying and pasting. We're not just canceling out some sentences so it's smaller. We're actually thinking through, this. these are the major components. We're going to reduce those, keeping the major components, we're going to reduce it down into one or two sentences, okay? So this is part of the exegetical paper. We're gonna practice this, okay? So. That's all I'm going to say there. And then there's other examples here. Um, but that doesn't really help us for today because today we're focusing on uh, reflecting, uh, your reflecting reading, making those paragraphs. I just wanted to show you how there's different paragraphs and how you have to have a different approach. You have to have a roadmap. Any questions or comments before we go to, to the last part, which is really um, now unpacking uh, I'm going to give you some ideas for, for your reflection paper. Any comments or questions, or is that making sense? Okay, good. And remember, this is on the EBST group page. This is on the EBST group page. So this whole handout's there. Just download it. You can print it out. You can reflect. And if you have further questions, you, you can save them for the next workshop, or we can, we can, uh, you could ask them for a moment in class, or you can email me and I can answer. Good. Okay, let's go on now to, let's go now to the last portion of this uh, short workshop. This is how I would recommend that we, that you prepare your reflection paper. So you have, so I'll just label re reflection paragraphs, okay? So what are the components that I want you to have in your reflection paragraph? Remember, now, now remember the reflection paragraphs, there's two kinds. The two kinds of, of reflection paragraphs, number one, it's, a, it's a, a positive interaction and also a, a negative Skeptical interaction. Now, especially for Filipinos, or sometimes all of us, we are tempted. Americans are very skeptical. Okay, Americans are very skeptical. Uh, Phil Filipinos, and, and again, I correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to misspeak here, but it seems to me that especially in uh, when you're trying, you're in the learning process, you really want to uh, 
to seek approval and to be agreeable with, with teachers and with the sources, okay? And that, that's a good, to have a teachable spirit is very good. So that is really a strength of, of Filipinos. I really want to emphasize that. At the same time, <clears throat> um, in the classroom, we should have this teachable, uh, this teachable uh, mentality, this teachable uh, desire. But when it comes to reading books, we do have to develop a critical, a critical component to our learning perspective, uh, uh, to our, our, our learning, um, I guess, toolbox, because there's a lot of good things out there and there's also a lot of bad things. And there's a lot of things that you have truth mixed with error. And so it, this is why it's partly, you know, people talk about just, oh, just having a basic Bible college. But um, Henry and myself and even others, Danny, is we want to, to bring you to the next level, not for pride, not because, oh, knowledge is everything, but because um, Paul actually says this to Timothy. He says, guard the teaching, be careful over the teaching, because in doing so, you will save yourself and your, and your and your followers okay and so the whole point is that we need to have a critical eye both in what other people underneath us are reading and also assessing what are good resources what are not so good resources what what are resources that should not be included so so with reflection paragraphs you need to have a, a positive you need to look and say what can i learn from this author positively. You also need to develop the skill of what, what, are, what are some red flags? What are some things that I, I'm hesitant upon? We just don't accept everything. Someone who embraces an author fully without qualification will, will go down a wrong road. Even when I was young, younger in seminary, there was one or two authors I embraced and was always defending them. And it was a mistake. It was a mistake. We should embrace, but we should always be careful to, to, to everything that's given to us, we, we're like Bereans. We investigate everything, okay? We, we, we investigate it through the, the lens of Scripture. So, so there's, but in both of these, both positive and negative interactions, we're going to use the same method, okay, for, for paragraph formation. And so what, the, what it is is uh, just bringing in the, uh, the handout. So I'm looking at the handout, and then we're going to move to some, some conclusions here. So, so number one, you, you need a topic sentence. Okay? So, so you need a topic sentence. And what I would actually also recommend doing the, the easier thing is just, I would also just always um, refer to one quotation. It's just easier versus just, so what, what I would do here is I would quote, like my example, write out the quotation of what you're interacting with, and then, and then you can have a topic sentence. I, this, this, sent, this, paragraph this sentence resonated with me because and then just give that specific topic what what resonated with you this this is related to something i learned here so there's different ways you could have you could have here um uh the topic could be agreement it could be uh, a comparison It could be a, a correlation. A correlation to an idea in scripture. When we worked through my, my reading, I had one that was connected to, I agreed with it, really. I just agreed with it. And then I wanted to explain why I agreed with it. Uh, I, in another example, I, I made a comparison with a contemporary situation that was occurring. In another situation, I was making a connection between the Philo and the Alexandrian school with the, the, rabbinic, the rabbinic Pharisees and the rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic school. Um, it, it's, it's mainly composed of Pharisees. And, um, and then there's also 
if another example I gave, there's a correlation to an idea in scripture. Okay, so so there's different there's different positive uh, reflections that you can have, but you need to pick one. And then just just your first sentence just describes it. So I'm like, okay, that's what he's looking at. And then and then the next part is you need to have supporting sentences. And I said a four I said four four sentence minimum. So ideally, you would need one topic, uh, two supporting, and then one concluding. So that's four, okay? But you could have five or six. All right, but the minimum is four. So you need one topic sentence, two supporting sentences, and then, and then one concluding sentence, okay? And so within the supporting sentences, uh, you could have reasons. Uh, you could have explanations. So you can explain why. Uh, explanation sentences. And also looking here uh, within a subset of here. So you could give a reason and then you can give an explanation. You could make, you could make connections with something else. You could, you could compare, oh, I'm sorry. You could compare and you could compare uh, something that you saw there and say, it's happening in our contemporary context in our church here. It's the same, right? So one other, one other that I haven't yet seen and you can think about is there are people that would say we reject allegorical, non-literal interpretation, but yet functionally in our church, some are practicing it. <laughs> so that could be, that could be, hey, even though we reject the allegorical school with Philo, we reject, reject uh, pharisaical uh, Midrash, uh, I've seen it done in a church here. And, and, and so functionally, maybe it's the same thing. So that would, be a, that would be a comparison and descriptive. And again, that's positive because you're saying that what's happening there is also happening here. Okay? So what I'm trying to get at is there's a lot of different routes you can go. You don't have to use all of these. This is just, this is just types of sentences that kind of you have the options to make. Okay? And then lastly, you want to have here a concluding sentence. And this concluding sentence uh, number, uh, this, could be, this could be a summary. So you could just summarize what you already stated. You could, you could restate. and include support. And then C, you could, you could also give a call to action. And maybe this is plus, maybe this is plus, call to action. In, in reading the history of interpretation, I, I am called to be much more humble in my interpretation, recognizing that we all make mistakes or, or, you know, we should be humble or um, I am, I really see the need to be much more careful in my interpretation because there's been so many, so there's so, something like that, something like that. Okay. So there's a lot of, a lot of trajectories you can go. And remember this, this can be for both the critique and the positive. Pastor, so you mean we're going to put both positive and negative, or I mean... What, well, no, so what I'm saying is, Diba, we have, Diba, we have question number one, oh, sorry, question number one in your reflection is, is uh, describe something that you resonate with, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the positive. Question, positive number, okay. question number two is a skeptical negative interaction. So, so you're going to use this same procedure you'll use the same procedure both for paragraph one and paragraph two. You're writing the same type of paragraph. But it's, okay, okay. Yeah, flip. You're just flipping it. But yeah, just do the same pattern. Yeah. Okay. And remember, so just to be clear also, I'm not saying you should have reasons, explanations, connections, all. I'm saying, so this could be, this could be or. 
or, or, or. It could be and. Mm. So I'm saying there's many combinations. There's many combinations. In your, in your, just imagine this is just giving, this is essentially giving you the parameters of how to create. So like in basketball, for those who play basketball or sports, right? You have the rules of basketball and then you can do whatever you want. You can dunk, you can shoot the three, you can dribble in, jump shot, around the back, pass, layup, right? So there's many different possibilities within the rules of basketball. So just imagine here, I'm laying for you the rules and the possibilities for your reflection paper. And then this with as many different combinations as you want. And again, the minimum, the minimum I want though is the minimum is four per sentences. Yes. So you could actually have, you could have this, you could have one topic, one reason, one explanation. You're explaining the reason that you give conclusion. It's done. Okay. So um, and our maximum is um do you have any maximum number of sentences? Um I do I do I don't want it to go more than two pages double spaced. Okay. So your entire reflection paper can be between one to two pages. Okay. Double space twelve font. Make sure double space twelve font, one to two pages. So you're gonna be one page because you have two paragraphs. A total of nine sentences, and then remember, you also have you also have the the the, the third part is a the, the third part is the is the is the question or further research, right? That's the third part of it. Is, is everyone tracking? Is anyone stressed? Is it making sense? I'm seeing some blank stares. I want to make sure that it makes sense. So, Pastor, in the question for further research, it's like it's it stays blank. It's it will remain a question. It's like yes, exactly. It's okay. Like, yeah, it's yeah. So I'll be clear, you're not answering, it. and it's something. The reason why is I want you to think because for me, I will like even here. And even in my meeting last time, the session last time, I have some questions that in the back of my mind, okay, I'm going to study that later. Okay, but I just don't have the time. And again, part of the, the, part of the assignment is to get you to be thinking like, okay, this is an open-ended question that I'm not agreeing to, I'm not disagreeing to, some, sometime I'm going to study it, yeah. So don't worry about answering it. Now, if you were so engaged and you wanted to <laughs> Go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> okay. After your okay. required assignment. After your required assignment. But yeah. Yeah, I, I had this kind of dilemma when my uh when my dad and I were discussing. You remember the third uh the third what you call this verse yeah. for the paper? It's in James. Yeah. It's about good works. Yeah. <laughs> Faith without works is dead. And then I was like, Yeah, I, I kept on reading that, but I did not like I did not chew it properly something like that then I was, yeah what was it about and then that's what that's why i placed it there but i was like oh please uh it's kind of difficult to <laughs> to what do you call this uh to put an end to it yeah because yeah. Uh, actually i'm staying with my uh in-laws and yeah. my mother-in-law is actually a catholic okay so uh, you know uh, we we actually talk times and did something about that but it's a good so thing she's, that so she's, is. So she's emphasizing the good work component. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, um, uh, I would tell her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Slowly, yeah. yes. But but she actually stayed with a what do you call this? Her, uh, it's a pastor. Uh, I mean, it's a uh, pastor's family. She she went to the U.S. Yeah. for studies, and then she stayed with a pastor fa pastor's family, and that's why she's also familiar with God. our doctrine so actually when we sing we would sing him together nice so okay. yeah so mom has a she she's already planted there's a seed planted in her that's why i'm that's good that saying good. yes yes yeah. no that's really good and there's always that balance of when you because there have been times before where i've had to be very focused because 
I will start preparing for a sermon and then I see something and then it's just down a rabbit trail and then my study's done and I have nothing. I've gone down the rabbit hole. So that's why I do, I do want us to think about, I want to keep us on point, write the question out and then put it aside because we do need to stay, we do need to stay focused. And, and I'm, and, um, I'm trying to become more disciplined because we do, we want to put those primary tasks first and these are side tasks. I'll, I'll give several other, I'll give you another example is that I'll have a question, I'll have a question that I'll, I won't write it out, but it's in my mind and I will have that and maybe it's one or two years before it's answered. It, it's like that. I've had questions about the book of Hebrews and it's been on my mind since 2000, since 2000, uh, um, 2018, 2018. Wow. And, and we studied Hebrews. Henry, where's Henry? Henry, right? We studied Hebrews at TBC. And then my small group in the U.S. church, they actually asked me to continue their small group. So I, I'm, I'm teaching with the, in the U.S. through Zoom. And uh, my, some of my questions were answered just in the small group. And so that's why, again, I want you to, to, to write out the question and then just to be meditating upon it. And eventually, eventually, you'll find that answer. Eventually, sooner or later, you'll find the answer. And it's just one of those things where, um, yeah, I want us to be thinking. I want us to be thinking like that. So anyone else want to add or any comments, any other further questions? Any comments? It's going to be an adjustment. I mean, this takes practice. It's taken me... Um, <laughs> many years i was in school for eight years so it's not don't think this first one this is not indicative it's just like you know i started practicing swimming and i was so i'm so bad at swimming i'm so unbelievably bad at swimming it's so awkward because it's not a natural movement these things take practice it takes practice and we just have to make a commitment each week we're just going to keep at it and slowly improving um Anyone else want to add? I think we're going to close because um, it's already past three. Okay, let's let's go ahead and close. Let's close this out. Um, Kaya, can you close us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I would like to praise you and thank you, dear Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Tim and for Pastor Henry and for my other classmates, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the inspiration, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me, Lord, this opportunity, Lord, to learn about your word. I, I'm really so blessed, dear Father, because um, even though I'm far from my family, but I still feel, Lord, that you're, still, you're here guiding me, Lord, even if I don't have um, my own family here with me. Thank you, dear Father. Thank you for the guidance. And thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us, Lord, a heart, Lord, to study your word. I pray, dear Father, that you continue, Lord, to strengthen us and that oh, we won't quit, Lord. Father, give us the strength, Lord, never to quit, Lord. And may we always pursue, Lord, to study more about your word. Thank you again, dear Father. All this I ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.